Welcome to the MIT Club of Germany uh, new format fireside uh, event. My name is Wolfgang Ungra. I'm part of the board of the MIT Club of Germany. And on behalf of uh, the board members, it's a great honor um, to be able to open this event. Uh, it's a new format, which we've um, developed literally in the wake of last year's um, online uh, formatting. Um, we started, uh, for some of you who've been able to join us last uh, October, with a new series called Climate Awareness or Climate Change Matters. It is a series we've uh, felt uh, very strong about uh, putting into place, unfortunately, of course, only as an online format, um, but with all the advantages now of being able to reach out uh, beyond uh, just the locale where we, lo where we are, meaning in Germany, and start including um, visitors and guests uh, and of course also speakers from uh, pretty much all over the world. Um, we started off uh, in October with a panel discussion and we've decided um, it would be worthwhile uh, expanding this format and making a, a smaller format, a little bit more um, informal, shorter, one hour with uh, two speakers where we um, encourage a discussion and a discussion between the speakers, but also obviously with you and your questions. Um, and it is a great honor for me today um, to kick this off. Um, it's the first fireside chat that we're doing, um, and it's uh, it'll be interesting to see what the responses are. It's also the first time that we are organizing this together with our colleagues and uh, friends at MIT Alumni Association. And Diane and Kim have been excellent in helping us put it together, set it up. So for us, it's a, a prototype uh, in that regard, or a, a pilot uh, event. Um, but Long story short, um, we are here today uh, to follow the thoughts and the inspirations of two absolutely stunning speakers and renowned in their field. Um, one, um, of course, uh, you may already remember uh, if you joined us in October, it's Peter Senge, who's joining us from Massachusetts, um, and we're also joined by John Elkington from London. Um, I trust most of you have been able to um, go over some of the details, but it's a uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to announce, um, especially right now, um, two speakers who have for most parts of their life really looked at uh, how we can challenge, how, how we can tackle the complexities around climate change that is required. And it's becoming more and more uh, an imminent issue, not only recognized obviously by, uh, by the UN and by various national governments, um, it is, of course, you find more and more speakers uh, who are advocating for the necessity of, 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 uh, of Im imminent action. Uh, but the complexity of it is so big that looking at uh, the systems thinking that is required and organizational learning that is required to tackle these is vital. So if I may briefly say a couple of words about Peter, who don't know him, um, Peter has been, is a, um, is a professor at the, uh, at the Sloan School of Management, a senior lecturer, um, and has been uh, training uh, leaders since many years on precisely uh, the sustainability challenges that we're facing. He also founded the Society of Organizational Learning um, and is currently uh, also co-founded, has also co-founded uh, the, the Academy for Systemic Change. And this is probably going to be part of what we're going to be learning from him today. The Sy Center for Systems Awareness is, uh, is one of his, his focus areas. Uh, and in fact, taking that into the future of education, uh, making sure that future leaders can take systemic uh, thinking into their considerations. And then um, after we hear Peter, um, we will hand over to John and also hear some of his thoughts and inspirations. John Elkington is founder and chief pollinator of Volans. Volans is a, uh, a venture company. Um, it is uh, very much dedicated again to global sustainability uh, and creating a movement uh, with numerous partners. Um, John is prolific, has been speaking in over 1000 conferences. And actually since the age of 28, he's been dedicating his time founding companies uh, in, with, the, with, the, with the mission of, uh, of contributing to sustainable policies and sustainable actions. So it's a great honor now to hand over um, to Peter. 
and have Peter take the floor and introduce us to some of his thinking. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Wolfgang. It's a pleasure to be able to join all of you today. It's also a special treat for me to get to do this with John. Uh, we don't get to see each other very often. Uh, even when we did travel, <laughs> I think we were not necessarily traveling to the same places, but we've known each other for a long time. And I've had a long uh, time respect for John and his work. So as you might imagine, these sessions uh, are also an opportunity to get old friends together and check in. Um, I'm gonna make some very uh, brief comments at the outset, then I'll hand it over to John. Um, and as Wolfgang said, this is, you know, almost like the archetypal, hopelessly complex issue. So uh, all I'm going to focus on is, is one point, really. And I want to show you a particular tool that we've been developing for many years at MIT that kind of gives a basis for elaboration around the basic delays, why this problem cannot be solved quickly. Um, in a sense, I have to contextualize that just a little bit because um, one of the ironies of our present day reality is we get used to things moving very quickly, right? Information literally travels around the world at the speed of electrons. And um, pretty quickly, that kind of confusion about the movement of information being so immediate uh, can, can kind of slip into the idea that, well, we should just be able to solve this, or we should be able to do something about this. Um, it wasn't like that 100 years ago. People did not expect important problems to be solved overnight. Uh, and, and, and the irony is that the essence of these issues really have to do with, I'll just say, the disconnect or the lack of harmony between the human world and the larger natural world. That's all the sustainability issues kind of fall into that broad category. The way we have come to live over the whole industrial period um, has been a process of increasing disconnect, increasing distance, and ultimately cultural disconnect. And this matter of time is a perfect example. One of my mentors who was an extraordinary CEO in a in a very traditional industry, built up a company over 30 years in the insurance industry, he used to like to say, it takes nine months to have a baby. It doesn't really matter how many people you put on the job. So the fact that there's kind of natural cycles, things that take time, and it doesn't matter how hard you try, doesn't matter how smart you are, <laughs> they still take a lot of time. Um, it's an old idea. It's not a new idea. But we've kind of lost touch with that. So I'm going to focus on just one thing, what we've come to understand about the nature of the time delays built into this problem of climate change. And three broad categories of those. Uh, there are institutional time delays. In other words, there's ways our institutions operate today that need to change. Uh, these changes take time, but you know they don't take eons. Uh, they may take much longer than they need to, but they need to change and they don't happen overnight. Then there's what I'm gonna call them infrastructure delays. Uh, the house I'm sitting in here was initially built uh, about 90 years ago. And it's not going to go anyplace, hopefully, <laughs> for the next 90 years. Buildings have a lifetime. Our automobiles stay on the road for a couple of decades on average, um, and so on. So there's the infrastructures that define how we live also have a lot of delays. And then lastly, of course, with issues of this sort and all the sustainability issues, since they really arise at this interface of the human social world and the natural world, there are the atmospheric delays in climate change. There are the natural physical system dynamics. They're in many ways the longest of all. So that's a simple idea and it's not a very radical one, but it's a very important one for us to kind of steep ourselves in because it's very easy to have unrealistic expectations. And unrealistic expectations are one of the most reliable ways to undermine systemic actions when those actions are inevitably going to take time. I'm going to show you a, 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 a slide in just a second. It's actually my screen of an online simulator 
Uh, we'll send you the link for this later. It's a freeware simulator. For over the last 30 years, there's been a group of us at MIT developing uh, climate change simulators for everybody, not just for experts in atmospheric uh, dynamics, climate experts. There are, of course, a lot of simulations that are used to understand climate change. Many of them literally take hours to run a single simulation or even historically days. But even with the acceleration of computing, still many of them take hours to run a single simulation. This one is both complex and extremely practical. It takes on the order of about uh, a third of a second to run a simulation. It's been developed initially by John Sturman, my longtime colleague at the Sloan School, and now a whole team. Uh, it, when we're all done, you can even Google this on your own. Climate Interactive is the website. And I'm gonna share my screen with you now so I can show you the kind of base run of Climate Interactive. So this is calibrated to match what the IPCC, the UN uh, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change calls the business as usual simulation. By the way, it's changed over the years. Uh, 10 years ago, when we first started sharing this tool with people, uh, the projected 2100 uh, temperature, if I recall, was 4.3 degrees C. As probably all of you know, these uh, degrees C's are the global mean temperature relative to what it was prior to the industrial age. So I want you to look at the graph on the right first. And I just point out something that's very simple, but kind of gets our feet on the ground here. There are a lot of concerns today around climate change, but we have not really seen climate change yet. Where we are today, you'll see my little cursor, I think, here moving, is right around here. And we are at about 1.35 degrees C above the pre-industrial global mean temperature. This little zone here, 1.5 to 2, starting uh, over a decade ago, 15 years or so ago, there was a general consensus forming amongst governments that we really needed to keep global temperatures from rising above two degrees C. But today we're nowhere near that. So whatever's going on in the world today that we might attribute to human generated climate destabilization, uh, just keep in mind, it's been achieved, it is occurring, in concert with a global mean temperature of about 1.35 degrees C. Um, on the left-hand side, there's lots and lots of graphs here. And I'm not gonna spend much time with the simulator. One of the reasons we want to introduce this to you, one is let you know this tool exists. It's a freeware simulator available to anybody. It's one of, I think, MIT's more significant contributions in, in this whole broad domain. Uh, I'm working now with a group of students uh, uh, middle school and high school age students who are part of a global youth, uh, uh, what we call the climate ambassadors, learning how to use this simulator integrated into the youth movements around climate change. So it's available to anybody. On the left-hand side, you'll see the distribution of current energy sources. Again, this is the baseline scenario, more or less calibrated to the IPCC scenario. And again, here's where we are today with coal, oil, gas, renewables, bioenergy, nuclear, and the new zero, there's an option in here for radical techno technological breakthroughs of zero degree, uh, zero carbon or zero greenhouse gas emissions energy sources. But of course, there's none of those right now. So it doesn't show up in, in these graphs. So I'm gonna do one thing to just show you how this works and make a point. So these are all down at the bottom, there's actually about a dozen different sliders, which correspond to different things could be done from a policy and intervention standpoint. In energy supply, transport, buildings, uh, economic and population growth, land and industrial use, and carbon removal. One of the ideas that we all kind of pay close attention to is carbon taxes and creating carbon markets. Uh, the IMF has suggested that the price uh, of these should be in the vicinity of about $75 a, a metric ton, which is very, very high given that there's virtually no carbon price today. So I'm just gonna show you the effects of implementing something like that. So I'm gonna slide this slider over and you'll see the curves shifting immediately. This is a price 
of around $100 a metric ton, implemented starting in 2021 over the next 10 years. You'll see how the curves changed. That's what we were. Here's what a very high carbon price implemented steadily over the next decade would do. And you'll see it moves us to a, um, a projected 3.1 degrees C temperature in 2100 versus the 3.6. It has a big impact, but nowhere near what's needed to get to two degrees C as the maximum temperature or even lower. So I wanted to just use this and we'll just kind of reflect a little bit on a couple of these curves right here, just to kind of stress the nature of the delays. Why does so little happen? This is a radical change. So this is an example of an institutional change. So this one is being implemented over a decade because realistically to think that globally we'd have agreement on a carbon price will take time. And certainly getting to one that's as high as a hundred dollars, uh, US dollars for, uh, per metric ton will take time. So we can call that the institutional delays, but there's actually more than just the institutional delays going on here. If you look at these curves, oh, coal is obviously a primary source of electricity. Well, what's driving the demand for that electricity? Well, it's the energy efficiency of our buildings. They take a long time to change. Even if we retrofit them, it doesn't change overnight. Uh, oil, primary fuel for our transport, doesn't change overnight. Even with a radical change in the price of the energy, these delays take time. Gas, obviously, is another main uh, fuel used for both buildings, particularly uh, buildings and uh, electricity and heating. And uh, while this green wedge of renewables is opening up, you'll see it takes a long time. I mean, today it's it's very very small, and this with this aggressive effort to accelerate the energy transition, it does make a difference. Notice what it was. Notice what it becomes, with this carbon price, this high carbon price. Okay, but it doesn't happen overnight. Why? It takes a lot of time. To shift over your capital stock, it takes a lot of time to replace coal-fired power plants by uh, alternative sources of energy. Yes, that can be accelerated. That's what a lot of these other sliders will do, but there are long delays. And lastly, you've got the institutional delays, you've got the infrastructure delays, the capital stock, built capital stock. And then lastly, you have the larger natural system we're interacting. I'm gonna show you one other curve here. CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, even with this radical change, you see this is the baseline, business as usual. This is what it becomes with this radical change. It's changing still very slowly. Why is that so slow? Well, one of the reasons is you can see the rapid effect on emissions of starting to accelerate the energy transition. So this curve starts to go down quite quickly. This is as we gradually implement the carbon price, but you see there's still a huge gap between emissions and removals. And actually removals is going down. It's going down because of, of, of deforestation. It's going down because a lot of things are already at play that are reducing the extent to which our uh, natural environment removes emissions. So that's a perfect example of a very long stocks and flows, the dynamics of the natural environment stocks. So this third category of, of, of delays is in the climate system itself. The, the turnover and shift of composition of our atmospheric gases will not happen quickly. So two last points in closing. This takes a long time. We face a century, even in a policy like this. And by the way, this can be accelerated. This is obviously not getting anywhere near to three to two degrees C or even 1.5 degrees C. All these other sliders make a difference. Please play with the simulator yourself. 
But no matter what you do, you came to the follow, you will come to the following conclusion. We all as engineers know about inertia. There's a lot of inertia in this system, institutional infrastructure and natural system inertia. We need to have a long-term sense of urgency. This is not going to happen quickly. And while on the one hand, that's obviously sobering, on the other hand, it gets our feet on the ground. To think that there's going to be miraculous changes in the next 5, 10, 20, even 30 years is unrealistic. This will define the way we live and hopefully the priorities for our societies for several generations. It's now a pleasure for me to turn over to my friend, John. John? Peter, thank you very much indeed. I hope people can hear me. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? Just check, checking that stuff. Great. Hi, um, John. So uh, firstly, I'd just like to, like to add my thanks to Wolfgang and Peter and the MIT Club of Germany for hosting uh, the event. Peter, what a glorious tool uh, this is. One of my great problems with system change uh, over the last sort of 40 years of, of working in this field has been so much of it has been so damned complicated and, and you know, sort of it was a cult uh, really for mathematicians and people who could uh, understand uh, spreadsheets and all the rest of it. And this is democratizing that. I, I'd love in the conversation to get into the question of whether what the emotional and political uh, impact of that democratization will be if you're starting to get younger people to use this. I mean, if, if I were them, I would be spooked. And the question is, how do we deal with that? So what I'd like to do, um, I don't know whether you need to take down your screen. I'm going to put up uh, a screen of my own. All right, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, good. And what I'm going to just quickly do is run through about five uh, slides. Uh, uh, Peter is obviously a scientist, uh, which befits uh, MIT, uh, and, and, and the best sort of scientist, a scientist who can uh, communicate and, and, and inspire. I'm not a scientist. I gave up science when I was um, 14 uh, years old against all of the advice of my um, uh, school, but then came back to write about science later on. And um, in some ways, I think I'm more a st storyteller, but I tend to do most of my storytelling in boardrooms and in C-suites of major companies. So my, my simple message, but I know I, it's not gonna be simple to apply, is that we've spent 50 years now trying to understand complex uh, systems and to some degree trying to manage them. Uh, and in addition to all of that and built on top of that, and I think this tool is a very good example of, 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 of how we might do that, uh, informing that process, we've got to regenerate systems and not just natural systems, although those are cru crucial. We've got to uh, regenerate our economies, our societies, our political systems, uh, and so on. And, and pretty much the time when Peter was publishing his book, uh, The Fifth Discipline, so right at the beginning of the 1990s, and talking about um, organizational learning, I was thinking about what particularly business organizations would need to uh, learn over time, what, what agendas, external ones particularly, they'd need to engage with. And the cartoon here, um, I had a Financial Times cartoonist do for me back in 1991. Uh, and it was basically quite simple, and just making the point that any board uh, over time would need uh, to engage with the natural world and, and, and ideally have representatives uh, of, uh, of that environment uh, around the table. They'd increasingly also have to deal with uh, social uh, issues, you know, poverty and, and, and um, a whole range of other uh, factors, which traditionally, and particularly in the Milton Friedman uh, paradigm, were, were sort of beyond uh, the boundaries of what it was proper or felt proper uh, for businesses uh, to um, uh, cover. And then the, the, the robot at the right of the uh, cartoon was, was something of a, 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 not a joke exactly, but it was a provocation to say that at a time when businesses were largely short term in their thinking, and investment very often, there were exceptions to that, but, but most companies uh, that would have been true of, you needed um, a, a reflection of the deep long-term agenda around the uh, boardroom table as well. Now, I'm talking about boardrooms, so this, this could be in the cabinets of, of governments or, or, or whatever it might be. And after that, I came up with a triple bottom line. 
1994 and uh, recalled that insofar as you can ever uh, recall a management concept through the Harvard Business Review a couple of years back. Now, I didn't mean to say that was the end of the triple bottom line or of the need to uh, address economic, social, environmental, political factors uh, in, 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 in business decision making. All I was trying to say was that in a way, what we'd got very good at was measuring in silos, but not very good at uh, integrating all of this in a way that meaningfully uh, changed the systems of which we're part. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, much of this. I'm going to simply say uh, I, I, I did a, a book that came out April last year. It's on the right there, Green Swans. Uh, and we're just in the process of launching a, an observatory to study and track green swans. Let me just very quickly explain what we understand green swans to be. Uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, as many of you will know, came up with the notion of black swans. Uh, these are things that um, surprise us, they come out of the blue. They have a massive off the scale impact. And very often after the event, we do not properly uh, understand what's just uh, hit us. So I, to, to put it rather starkly, to me, black swans very often start off at least as um, trajectories, trends, uh, events that take us exponentially where we don't want to go. And the question that I ask in the book is, what would it be like and how might we get to the point where some of these trends take us exponentially where we do want to go and increasingly need to go? And the, the subtitle, uh, The Coming Boom in Regenerative uh, Capitalism, probably looked a bit peculiar to people who first picked up uh, the book, but within sort of four or five months, and I'm not claiming direct connection at all, but um, Doug McMillan, CEO of Walmart, the world's largest retailer, uh, committed his company uh, to regeneration. Now that largely came through uh, the, the, the advice of uh, Paul Hawken, who many of you all know, but Walmart now are, are doing a very major event, very shortly, imminently, uh, with the CEOs of many of their supplier, uh, John, John, yes, so this, is, this is Wolfgang, sorry for interrupting you. Um, I think the audience cannot see your slides. If you want to have a look at that again, please. Thank ah. you. you so I, I wish you'd said that earlier on, but let me just, um, let me just try and reshare. Oh, that's, that's um, disappointing. I'm uh, sorry. Um, 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 um. So let me go there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just go on where we are. And can you see that? Yes. Okay, let, let, let me just very quickly go backwards um, and do a couple of things just so people know. This was the cartoon. Uh, I'm sorry that you couldn't uh, see that. So nature, society, and the long-term uh, represented uh, in that cartoon. Um, this was the book that I was talking about and the observatory uh, logo. This is Doug McMillan, who some of you will have had uh, the pleasure of meeting or seeing or whatever, but he's the CEO of uh, Walmart. Uh, and he's the one who has just committed their company to uh, regeneration. Uh, again, going back to um, Peter's point that there are so many delays in the system. This is gonna be a long-term uh, project. Nonetheless, I think having that, not just a sense of short-term, not just long-term urgency, but that sense that we're really gonna have to um, exponentially change uh, some of our systems. So, you know, in the past, systems have often changed because of a, a, a prior pandemic, a war or whatever that knocks out some of the infrastructures that uh, lock us in, but probably we're not going to have that this time around. When people ask the question then, so what is a green swan? To me, it's not an individual CEO like, say, Doug McMillan. Uh, it's not a particular technology it's much more likely to be a shift, a shift in markets, a shift in politics, a shift in uh, mindsets. And so an example I give is the uh, Green Deal in the European Union. So 1.82 trillion uh, euros last time I looked, and it will be profoundly political and it will be profoundly uh, complicated to deliver. But that sort of ambition uh, to address sort of inclusion and environmental green uh, climate related factors, I think for me, uh, is green swan thinking. This is the last slide, and it's just simply to make a point that I mentioned science right at the beginning, and this was a front cover of The Economist uh, in 2011, so uh, 10 years ago, and it really introduced to the business world the notion that we were moving into the Anthropocene, 
a period when one species, our own, influenced the entire planet. Uh, and we don't really yet have the politics, the governance systems uh, in order to um, deal with that. So on the right, you have a diagram that we've put together with a range of different companies we work with and one regulatory authority, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. And it, the diagram tracks through three horizons, relatively short term, uh, medium and, 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 and longer, but you'll notice there's no time uh, uh, exactly defined at the bottom. And my sense very strongly is that we're coming out of a paradigm, an economic order, a way of doing things uh, which has lasted since the Second World War. Uh, and these um, periods do not happen very quickly. If we get through this uh, or begin to get through this in the next 12 to 15 years, we're doing remarkably uh, well. Um, so this is another thing that's going into the delay factor that economic systems do not uh, change over uh, night, nor do the geopolitics, although th at the moment things are beginning to ch uh, change at a remarkable uh, rate, not always in the right direction. And COVID-19 is an accelerant uh, of a lot of this, for, for, for better or uh, worse. In the deep long-term future, you want to get to regenerative systems, you want your sort of legal frameworks, you want economics, you want all these different components to work in, in support of um, a cleaner environment, a more inclusive uh, form of uh, uh, economic activity and inclusion and all that sort of stuff. Um, and in the middle, you've got the um, growing concern in leaders, whether it's public sector, whether it's investors, whether it's business or whatever, about resilience. Resilience of individuals, of families, of communities, of uh, societies and economies, and critically uh, of the uh, biosphere beyond all of that, which is what uh, the Anthropocene is um, uh, going out to. So I, one of the things I'd like to discuss in just the, um, the, the, the discussion with Peter, and I'll end the um, sharing at that point, is whether we're sufficiently training, and you know, with M MIT as the context, the, the younger people of all ages um, uh, in, in the sort of system thinking uh, that they will need and the analytics that will go along with that, and really whether we can leave it just to younger people and training them, or whether we've got to put um, all the older generations, I'm a baby boomer, almost in sort of forced re-education camps. <laughs> <laughs> but Peter, what's your thinking on that? Well, it is uh, one of the core, uh, you might say, strategic dilemmas. Uh, and the way I would kind of pose it as a dilemma is that we know where the power resides now. Yeah. Uh, we just do it in terms of age. Obviously, it's extraordinary how much of the institutions that shape our society, particularly in the public sector, actually, are, are, are really governed by people our age and above. Um, and then you look at the business world and you say, well, there's maybe a bill of broader distribution and you have so many of the, 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 the growth in tech kind of companies that have relatively younger uh, leadership. But on the other hand, uh, it's very hard to find the individuals or institutions thinking multi-generationally. Yeah. The people who had naturally have the biggest stake in this are not surprisingly the ones who get it the deepest, which are the young people, the children, I mean, I, it's it's maybe a bit of an overstatement, but my experience is it's very hard to find six, seven, eight-year-olds who aren't aware of poverty and climate change as two things that are really going on. They're not sure exactly what they are, but believe me, I, I've heard a lot of conversations with very young children to, be, to realize that it's just part of the deep concerns that they have. And by the time, of course, you're a teenager, these have crystallized, often ironically, along with a sense of fatalism. Yeah. And disempowerment, like we're screwed, you know, in a, in a word. Um, so I think that dilemma, that the, the natural kind of uh, emotional gravitas sits with the youngest people, but the power does not. Um, I think it's against that backdrop that you have to kind of appreciate the global youth climate change movement, which I do think is one of the most important political developments in the world. Um, obviously, it's far from kind of everything that's needed, but I've been waiting for a long time. At what point do the voice of youth start to show up? And I think we're at that point now, they're starting to show up. So I do think it's, it's, it's a profound issue. You know, we think a lot about equity in many dimensions, 
um, today, I think that's become ironically, one of the many things that COVID has done is catapulted us into this awareness yeah. of the extraordinary inequities in our society, just by virtue of the way the, uh, the virus impacts different groups differentially. But a type of inequity that we have tended to still stay steer away from is age inequity. You know, uh, we you know we are borrowing the future from our kids. That's not a new statement. Um, and I think they're angry, and they they should be. And anger by itself is not sufficient, but it certainly starts to move the thing. How does it move from anger to something that you could consider a more balanced approach that will sustain? The problem with anger is not that it doesn't motivate. The problem is it motivates for short periods of time. I think it also motivates other people. And I'm now in the 60s and 70s uh, as part of the environmental movement and various other ones that are associated. I knew various people, three of whom turned out to be linked to terrorist groups later on. One was the, the Angry Brigade in, in the UK. She was sent to prison for 10 years. Uh, two others in Hamburg were linked to the Bader Meitnov. Uh, gang and I think it doesn't take many people to get so angry that they try and blow things up and that may be cyber hacking or something quite uh, different uh, yes. now for the authorities then to clamp down and you don't go exactly like Myanmar but you actually start to squeeze the political life out of the system and I think it's almost it it's almost as like your tool almost needs a wraparound which helps people process what they're going to be learning and the implications of what they're going to be learning and particularly uh, younger people Yes. Have you thought that through and what are you doing on well, that? Well, the groups that we're trying to um, help develop now as kind of little seed pods that could infiltrate mm. the youth climate movement are not just being trained in this tool. You made a very interesting comment at the very outset, John, and right? it's a good time to come back to me. In a way, I couldn't agree with you more. The purpose of tools, like I showed you, is to democratize the, the debate. Mm. So everybody can start to have a, you know, a bedrock understanding. And this is not so esoteric that it can only be understood by 25 people distributed around the world. It's complex. Yeah. But life is complex. <laughs> Raising your kids is complex. Complexity is life. And I have a lot of confidence that tools like this can be kind of symbolic of, hey, look, at there's basics we can all understand. Those last two curves of emissions and removals being out of balance, that's a bathtub. Yeah. Greenhouse gases are accumulating in a big bathtub we call the atmosphere. Everybody can understand this. If the inflows exceed the outflows, the bathtub keeps rising. That's what we got. So I, I think that um, that democratization, though, has a very important question that it poses, which is the one you pose. Are we ready emotionally for dealing with this reality? Because we know when you're confronted with an emotionally difficult message, there's two very predictable responses. One is you fight, you get angry, you, you, you throw stones, you criticize, you say, what are you doing? And you point fingers or you disengage. Yeah. And, and those are the two things we see going on around the world. So the young people we're working with are coming out of a, a whole larger process uh, which we call uh, compassionate systems education. It's my primary focus. And we've got hubs around the world in California and British Columbia and Southeast Asia, where there's a lot of effort to kind of bring a perspective as foundational into education. That we need to understand the fundamental interconnectedness of life, starting with this system, yeah. the mind, heart, body system, as the Chinese would say, uh, the social reality of groups and families and schools and classrooms and where I live, and of course, the larger systems. And that really has to become the bedrock of education. Now, that's a big undertaking, obviously, because uh, education is a vast institution. But I think the times are right and kids get it. Uh, there's no bigger issue in amongst educators right now. Interestingly, one of the many other things that the pandemic has accelerated than realizing that well-being is one of the real defining features of good education. And well-being requires an emotional sophistication on how this system is doing and, a, and an understanding that the commitment to well-being is not selfish. It's what it means to be a healthy citizen or a contributing citizen.
And a quick question around, we've talked about young people and children and so on, and, and both you and I work in, in businesses and, 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 and policy making and so on. I mean, I would love to see pretty much like now we have with COVID-19, you go through an airport, if you ever go through an airport, and they have this sort of temperature gauges. And uh, I'd love to see your uh, dashboard uh, from the tool actually on the front of every vehicle, every building, every company, headquarters, and so on. And that becoming not just something that blends into the background, but a subject of everyday conversation. How do you think policymakers and business and investors are responding to this or would respond to it if they could have that sort of information? Well, time will tell, obviously. Um, I mean, you and I have both been in this journey a long time. You kind of, in a, in a way, much more extensively than I. Um, and. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a wake up that's been going on for a long time. The idea that the business of business is business and, the, you know, that old cult paradigm yeah. that it's not our business, you know, the social ecological environment, which is ultimately essential. You know, you have to have social stability. You have to have environmental stability to have a climate for a healthy business. But that's not our business. Yeah. That attitude has slowly been eroding for a long time. And with it, you know, initially you said, well, that's that's the public sector, so therefore that's government's business. So partly what's helped that, ironically, is the growing the distrust that government's up to the job. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the seeds are there. Uh, I, I just think that um, it will. It's a it's a steady journey. I mean, I've I've used the analogy for a long time. The real the real purpose of of this whole movement this let's call it the sustainability movement in business and to some degree in government is to keep the ship from sinking it's in that transition period because that transition period is in a time frame that's a stretch but it's not incommensurable with what businesses good businesses do think over decades but they don't think over centuries so that's why it also needs to be driven ultimately by by an awakening of public awareness I think you Absolutely. need to. And, and I think different countries, you, uh, you know, China and others are coming at this very, very differently. And, and, and um, we might get onto that. But I just wonder whether, Wolfgang, you want to bring any of the QA uh, Absolutely. The audience in. John and Peter, thank you so much uh, for, for those insights. Yes, luckily, we've been uh, getting quite a few questions on the QA window. So as Kim has been uh, sending out, uh, if there are questions, please uh, send them to us in the Q&A window, um, and we will select a few now, and we will try to answer more questions later um, as, as we can. Let me take one question, uh, probably to both of you. Um, Michael Wilms is asking, we accelerated to damage the planet. Can't we accelerate to save the planet? And I would like to add one more observation from my side. Interestingly enough, with all the restrictions of COVID-19 on our travel patterns, on our consumption patterns, traffic uh, movement of people, it seemed like all those effects still were not sufficient to actually turn down the bathtub becoming fuller. Um, so if this is already not sufficient, what can we do to actually accelerate? Because of course, as we all know, COVID enforced it on a lot of our societies and our, our patterns. What can we do to accelerate um, our, our uh, measures against global uh, and, and, and climate destruction? Well, Peter, do you want to go? Necessary, but not sufficient. I mean, again, this is part of the maturing process. And this is why I keep kind of coming back to, we have to recognize this will be the journey of the century and it's not gonna go over quickly. These are good things, keeping the airplanes grounded, uh, having all of us discover how many ways we can work from home and not have to be in our cars nearly as much as we were. These are not unimportant. I, I don't think we'll ever go back. I mean, uh, uh, one of my good friends at MIT just moved uh, further west from Boston than I live. I used to live further west than any of my other faculty colleagues. He said, I'm not gonna be going into MIT more than two or three days a week for the rest of my career because we've discovered we can do a lot without traveling quite as much. These are good developments, they're just not sufficient. I don't think this is complicated. We have to learn how to acknowledge progress and not unrealistically think, ah, but we're not there yet. Human beings have been learning to live out of balance with the environment for a very long time. The industrial age has accelerated the process around the world. 
This is a journey of centuries to get in the mess we have. We're not gonna dig out of this hole in five years. Yeah, and just very quickly to the question around exponential challenges, can we not come up with exponential solutions? I think the exponential solutions are out there. They're not always technology driven, but increasingly digital technology is at least potentially taking us in some of the right directions. And you look at the cost curves um, on, on renewable energy, you know, uh, solar, wind, yes. battery technology on, and so on. It's extraordinary. And, and technology people, as many of you know, talk about something that Hemingway first brought up, the sort of gradually then suddenly uh, world. One of the Hemingway's characters was asked how he, quit, how he went bankrupt. And the answer was gradually then suddenly. And we live in one of those worlds. And I think the twenties are gonna see more change than most of us have seen in our lifetimes. Question, how do we ensure that that's good change? And it's good change for most of us, not just for uh, elites. And I would just direct people, if they haven't already come across the work of Rethink X, based both in uh, the UK and in Silicon Valley. And they've looked at three sectors to date. They're about to go on to a fourth finance. The first one was transportation mobility. The second one was cattle ranching and dairying. And the third one, it was energy. And all of these systems are about to go through periods of profound existential shock. Now, in terms of climate, pretty much all of that change is gonna be a good thing. If you remove 60% of the animals from the American uh, cattle system, you, you, th that's a good thing in terms of uh, uh, climate, at least potentially. But the social and political uh, repercussions are gonna be absolutely profound. Do we yet see political leaders and political parties and so on, uh, uh, and political processes that properly engage that. I think absolutely we do not. And therefore we somehow got to shake up the political system even more than it has been uh, in different countries uh, to date. So, and that's, that's exciting. I think, I think these moments in our collective history are where the opportunity to step up and do things in new ways, try new stuff goes off the curve, so yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, that does take me to another question that was asked, which actually connects right to it. In your experience, what are the best ways of engaging executives and management with systems thinking? In particular, how has Peter used systems dynamics for climate change in the business context and to what success? So again, trying to engage those who can probably shape it and change, uh, and change uh, their policies in their own corporations and, and their organizations. Peter, would you like to take that one? Sure, I, I think John will undoubtedly have some important additions. I, look, at business is a pragmatic institution. You know, you, you cannot be effective as a, as a CEO of a business purely based on philosophic, you know, convictions. So one simple translation of that for these issues is that how do we make the type of path we want to be on for the long term attractive and viable in the next five to 10 years. You know, how do we market? How do we build a different brand? I guarantee you, Doug McDermott's thinking a lot about that at Walmart. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see Walmart's marketing profile as a regenerative institution, but I guarantee you, he hasn't made the commitments he's made without starting to think about that. You know, he's got to be able to convince his board in three to five years, this is helping us as a business. Now that may not be just direct to the bottom line, but it's attracting more customers. It's new customers, different types of customers. I'm just okay, illustrating now. You know, we often think the arguments to the board are all in, in nickels and dimes. Yeah, they are at some level, but another level, they're, they're much more than that. You've got to be able to argue that there are elements of the long-term viability of this business that we're building now that are going to help us over the next three to five years. Yeah, and I, I was going to say something that I probably shouldn't say. Uh, it's not politically correct. Uh, and, and in the way, when I first started dealing with companies 40 years ago, people who were system thinkers tended to be engineers, chemists, people with that sort of background. And by God, they were a nightmare to engage on these sorts of issues because they had a different system uh, oriented mindset. Uh, and, and where you at that stage would uh, uh, come across people in business, in particular at senior levels, they were either mutants, very uh, strange in, 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 in their own world, or they would have had a major reverse at some stage, which would open them up to the possibility that that might happen again. Or, but that was typically not at senior levels, they were women. 
and 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 women understood this at a level that was just different i mean it made sense uh, to them and now i think that's shifting i think the the issue now is that people at senior levels and business investors and so on they know the world is changing but they also know that the, the risks that they will be taking as they start to transition their business models and their organizations and their investment portfolios into this new world go off the scale uh, too so it's quite natural I and mean, it's another delay function but that they, they will hold back it's like children waiting to see or penguins waiting to see who's going to go and get eaten by the leopard seal first uh, they hang back but in a way what we've got to do is get them into that new reality and just very quickly one one way in which i've seen that happen is when people go not just getting external stakeholders into their headquarters building which a lot of companies have now got quite adept at doing it's actually when they get out and go into other people's realities and see what's happening on the ground in other parts of the world so i think learning journeys and experiential learning and this sort of stuff incredibly important very hard to do in COVID uh, circumstances but we've got to get back to that as fast as we possibly can. John, thank you so much. Um, I would like to now also take the opportunity to introduce Peter. Peter is also a member of the MIT Club of Germany. Uh, Peter has been instrumental in uh, bringing uh, Peter Senge and, and John together. Um, and together um, with Peter, we're putting together this, uh, this talk series. Um, Peter, um, I would love you to uh, maybe also take a few questions from the audience. Um, and then yeah, absolutely, Wolfgang. Give us an, out view, uh, an outlook as we're almost approaching the end. We still have nine minutes, so I think it'll probably still be enough for maybe two questions. And then, Peter, um, I think you're going to be closing off just giving us an outlook on, on what else is coming. But why don't you go and, uh, and take, take the next question, please? No, absolutely. Thank you, Wolfgang. So let's see. Uh, there was one interesting question for GLS Haku. That's probably an acronym, but anyway. Uh, so he or she asked, what are the best incentives and, and penalties to improve the current situation? It's a little bit like the carrot and stick thing. Yeah, Maybe the one, top one or two or three that come to mind for you, Peter and John. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm just go first. Well, just very quickly, I think one of the things that's starting to happen, and, and, and particularly in some of the very big companies now under existential pressure, you think about Shell, where their CEO is saying they think increasingly they're on the wrong side of history. They're actually starting to put uh, um, really strong financial incentives into the, the um, compensation of, of senior executives. I think that's enormously important. In fact, I think it's a necessary condition, but I think we've also got to go through hearts and minds uh, as well and in different ways. I don't think you can simply uh, incentivize people like sort of laboratory animals uh, out of bad habits. You know, we all know they're difficult to break and particularly when your future uh, depends on them. Yeah, I think this is actually a, a, an old kind of timeless issue of, of executive leadership. You know, good behavior has to come because it makes sense and it feels like the right thing to do. The problem is we incentivize a lot of stupid behavior. <laughs> so what we really need to do is look at all the things we incent that are heading us in the opposite direction, but don't fool ourselves. Uh, this is in, a, in psychological terms, this is the old difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. You cannot extrinsically motivate people to be good people, but you can sure as heck extrinsically motivate them to do a lot of bad things. But you have to also cultivate the intrinsic motivation. It's it's both. It's a big and. Good, thank you. Great guys. I have another one which comes in a little bit from a technology perspective. Yeah, uh, I think both for both of us, it's about electric vehicles and what you guys, both of you, think about the kind of goals that automakers set themselves around electric vehicles. Well, it's as good as it helps. It, again, if you if you want to go play with the simulator, you can move those sliders. The electrification of transportation is one of the sliders you can move, and it 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 does have effect. Uh, you have to keep in mind again this one of the delays, the sources of inertia, the capital stock turnover. Um, so there's two points of leverage here. One is accelerating the transition to alternative uh, sources of uh, so alternative vehicles. The other is getting the old vehicles off the road. So we, we tend to think of the inflow to that stock, not the outflow. Yes. 
And secondly, of course, this is all tied up with where the electricity comes from. And even, you know, in, in Massachusetts, where we still get two thirds of our electricity from coal, roughly, I mean, most of the US does, even in this context, electrifying fleet does help, but only in concert with really changing the sources of the electricity does it make a big difference. And I think in many ways, um, urban concentration is one of the things that's working in our favor with climate uh, it, and therefore sort of subway investments and things like that, public transit uh, is a better uh, route for electrification. But insofar as we go for private vehicles as the way forward, it's astonishing the systemic shock to the automobile uh, industry. I remember working with Ford in the early part of this uh, century and Elon Musk was out there, not really properly on their radar screens at all. I was fascinated by him and just watching him over these, uh, you know, couple of decades, completely throw that uh, sector off balance. And now you've got 500 EV uh, uh, models uh, planned for uh, 2023. This is this is transformational, and I hope people will learn the lesson from it in business and finance and so on. If it can happen to the automotive industry, and if it's happening now to the oil industry, it's going to hit us all, uh, and we should wake up. Yeah. It's interesting, John, yeah. because of course I, I spent a fair amount of my my career in the automotive industry, and it did take a disruptor like a Tesla for people yeah. to actually open up their eyes and see yeah. what's going on. Uh, and it just requires a bit of a shock therapy. And I remember uh, being in the automotive world where, frankly, there was a, a bit of an arrogance also um, as to the smaller players emerging. Uh, and I think that that mood has changed. Whether electrification is now the solution is to be seen um, because of course there's many other technologies that uh, that need to be tested and, and seen in terms of their total footprint. But um, if, I, if I may, uh, there's one more question I, I would like to raise and then and maybe uh, Peter, you would, you would like to do the last one. One question came out of the audience about, about the generational uh, perceptions and how can we bridge that the generations can start a more productive dialogue because um, it was mentioned earlier, yes, we are uh, sort of an older generation in the, in, the, in, the, in the seat of decision-making and the younger generation has the biggest stake. We need to find a way of communicating and finding solutions together because it's the future generations that will be impacted most. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I, mean, I like John's picture a lot with the with the three different curves. You know, we can all recognize that it kind of looks like the transition of you know products and in an industry, right? We all recognize those kind of transitional curves, and I think that one way we can begin thinking about this sort of partnership, and maybe that's not the best words, but you know, a more harmonious relationship between the young generation, the and those in power now, is those curves. The young generation can do little about the middle curve, the transition. The Doug McDermott's can do a lot. The Doug McDermott's can do very little about the next 30 to 50 years, other than maybe get on a path. So I think there's different roles and we have to appreciate that we really do need each other. We absolutely do. And I think the most dangerous thing would be if the baby boomers, for example, hand over this agenda to younger people saying, we tried to do this, we yeah. failed, over to you. Well. You know, that, that, that's a recipe for disaster. And I think we've really got to lean in and help uh, younger people do stuff that they don't know how to do and we don't yet know how to do. And I, I feel the next 10 to 15 years of my career, I'm 71, are going to be the most exciting, challenging and dangerous in some ways politically of my entire working life. But what an exciting time uh, to be alive. Two, two prescriptions or ideas, two companies we're working with are appointing youth boards. That's one way. Another is reduce the voting age, take it down to 16 and train people to vote uh, and just get that voice in more and more powerfully. It's the only way that politicians are gonna to listen to this. Okay, hey, thank you guys. So we're coming to the top of the hour and I know that Peter Senke needs to, to run to a workshop he's running today. So I would like to thank you very much, Peter and John. It was a real pleasure. It was exciting. I mean, it was a, Great pilot, Wolfgang was talking about the pilot, but I really enjoyed the format and I hope that you did as well as the attendees today. I know we have a lot of unanswered questions. We will find a way to get some answers to you afterwards, as well as the link to the recording and other things. Uh, so before I 
talk only for 30 seconds or a minute a little bit about what we have planned in the last couple of months around events in our Climate Change Matters event series. Uh, again, thank you very much, Peter, John, for joining us. So I do hope that in the future you may join us for another event. It was a real pleasure. For me too. Okay. Thanks so much for all the organizing. And if you invite John again, I promise to come. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so approaching the hour, uh, quickly, uh, you see hopefully the slide and the church on the screen. Uh, the En-ROADS was already mentioned by Peter Sengi. We plan to do a workshop in May. Uh, we also have the next thing is uh, again to our panel event, sustainable supply chain, a couple of interesting organizations involved, including Fair Trade International and the Center of zero carbon shipping of Maersk in Denmark. Uh, we will have something around energy transition uh, and startups. Then we talk a little bit about climate policy, where we compare what's happening in Germany and also the US perspective. And then we have an interesting event also around the specific problem of microplastics. You had a lot of about it where we bring together MIT with a kind of K-12 educational with a local school here in Germany and a couple of uh, solution providers, certainly also interesting topic. Uh, we will send out an email after you, after this, with the answers to the questions, uh, with the link to the video, uh, and also where you can find further information for future events. Thank you very much for joining. We went a little bit over, hope that's okay for you. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them uh, either uh, on the chat window or reach out to you when you do the registration, you have our email address. Thank you very much, have a nice day, a nice evening, and we do hope to see you soon in our next event. Bye now. Thank you, bye-bye.